Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Whether or Not. I'm your host, Joe Rook, joined by the forecaster this week, Ryan DePhillips. Now, Ryan, we've been in a stretch of on and off rain showers. Is there any relief in sight? Yeah, it's a great question, Joe, as for the most part, I'm foreseeing mostly dry weather with some on and off showers, but the big story will be the cool down. Now, with that cooler air, we also may unfortunately see some less sunshine, as I'll have more details on that in my forecast. Well, that's unfortunate if you were looking to spend time outside like myself. But for Nature in the News this week, I will be talking about that helicopter that landed on Mars and when the next flight is, as well as an insight into the upcoming allergy season. How about you, Ryan? Yeah, I'll be talking about this past March's climate statistics in the U.S. and the impact that the Western droughts have on water supply. Also, we have a feature from our very own Salix Iverson, on the infamous Johnstown, PA flood of 1889. But first, here's Nature in the News. If you were watching a few weeks ago, I did a story about Mars helicopter ingenuity and how they had a test flight plan. And unfortunately, the wait must continue for this first test flight as some issues arose. During a test of Ingenuity's dual carbon fire rotors Friday, engineers identified a problem with the sequence of commands that would initiate flight, according to NASA. In a press release, NASA said, our best estimate of a targeted flight date is fluid right now, but we are working towards achieving these milestones and will set a flight date next week. NASA Mars rover Perseverance carried the tiny four pound helicopter when it landed on the red planet all the way back February 18th. Since then, NASA has overseen its robotic release and prepared the aircraft for flight. So stay tuned and be sure to uh, keep an eye on Ingenuity as we'll keep you updated for the next planned flight. This past March, climate statistics are in, and compared to the 127-year average, U.S. temperatures were 4 degrees Fahrenheit higher than average, and precipitation was slightly below average. A consistent southward dip in the jet stream otherwise known as a trough, dug its way into the western states and was responsible for cooler air spilling its way in. On the other hand, a consistent northward push in the jet stream, otherwise known as a ridge, locked itself in the eastern two-thirds of the country and was responsible for warmer air. In terms of precipitation, there was a wet bullseye of precipitation located in the heart of the country, while the rest of the country was drier than normal. It was a relief to see wetter conditions in western Kansas and eastern Colorado as drought conditions lessened exponentially in these areas. Well, it's that time of the year again. Allergies are back in full force. Experts say the effects from climate change are contributing to longer, harder to manage allergy seasons. According to the experts from the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America, rising temperatures have led to an extended growing season in the United States, making the springtime harder than ever for the 24 million Americans who suffer from seasonal allergies. Reppert, an AccuWeather meteorologist, has been closely studying the weather effects on pollen counts throughout his 20 years at AccuWeather, and he noticed some trends that point to longer and tougher seasons due to weather changes associated with climate change. Between 1995 to 2001, the U.S. growing season, which is the number of days that plants take growth in the nation, has more than doubled from 11 to 27 days due to warmer weather. The good news for us, well, it looks like these hardest hit areas will stick to the northern plains and the upper Midwest. Drought has become way too common in the western U.S., as 17 of the past 20 years have been considered drought years. The Palmer Hydrological Drought Index, PHDI, measures the long-term impacts of droughts, especially impacts on groundwater and reservoir levels. Since 1900, there has clearly been an uptick in the severity in drought with Arizona, Colorado, and Northern California leading the way. It's alarming for municipalities, agriculture facilities, and recreation facilities that rely on water supplies to see that not only 
59% of Western states are seeing drought, but also 44% of the contiguous United States. A vital source of water supply is from melting snowpack, particularly across the West. As measured on April 1st, since 1955, there has been a 15 to 30% decrease in water stored in Western snowpacks. This is a troubling trend as droughts themselves cost over $9 billion per event. April showers bring May flowers. Hello everyone, it's student meteorologist Ryan DePhillips with your central PA forecast. And I have to say, unfortunately, we are in for a pattern change. This past March and early this April, mostly sunny skies and warmer air than normal. But for the next few weeks, we are going to be on the cloudier side, the showery side, and most importantly, the cooler side. So. And if you see this on Friday, we have some heavier snow. Honestly, we could be seeing as much as 6 to 12 inches in New England. So very unusual for this time of year. Even into later Friday, I would not be surprised to see a sprinkle or flurry in our neck of the woods with mostly cloudy skies, temperatures 10 degrees below average. But then as we head into Saturday, that coastal storm starts to move off the coast with mostly cloudy skies in the State College area. As we head later to Saturday, some passing drizzle, but again, mostly on the dry side. And Sunday, cloudy conditions persist with some pop-up showers by the Great Lakes, perhaps getting into our neck of the woods as well. 10 degrees below average on Friday with a high of 49 degrees. But then as we head into overnight Friday night, slight decrease in cloudiness with a low of 37 degrees. So should be dry, should be Decent enough to go out and about if you don't want to have some of those raindrops or even snow flurries. Saturday, it's going to warm up a bit with a high of 54 degrees with some AM sun and some PM clouds. As I'll give you more info in the extended forecast on what we could expect on Sunday. But now, I'll take it over to South Iverson with a feature on the infamous Johnstown flood. According to the National Weather Service, Flooding leads to more damage in the United States than any other hazard and has averaged $4.6 billion in damage over the last 20 years. One of the most infamous floods happened just down the road from State College in Johnstown, Pennsylvania on May 31, 1889. I spoke with Richard Burkert, president of the Johnstown Area Heritage Association, about this historic event and the museum about it. Something like eight inches of rain fell on Johnstown from uh, May 30th to the afternoon of May 31st, 1889. Now, Johnstown had uh, been guilty of several, several serious environmental abuses. They would narrowed the channels in the rivers, had denuded the hillsides of trees. So they were seeing flooding like every year. Uh, but, you know, they, they got, that was just a fact of life. Johnstown would get its spring bath. Now, uh, in 1889, seems a little worse. In fact, before the dam broke, you had from three to 10 feet of water in, the, in Johnstown in the streets, making it virtually impossible had there been any way to get the word out, you know, for, for people to evacuate. But what happened it was that the dam really set the stage for disaster. Berker explains why this dam was so instrumental in leading to this devastating event. And the dam had originally been built as a reservoir by the Commonwealth, but had been abandoned and rebuilt by uh, industrialists, financiers like Andrew Carnegie, Henry Clay Frick, Andrew Mellon, and uh, 
when they patched up that dam, it was a faulty job. They had no idea what would happen if it broke. And when it did, it wiped out Johnstown, killed 2,200 uh, men, women, and children. The outcome of the dam failure was catastrophic. But the surviving residents of the Johnstown area banded together to get their city back. Uh, the recovery of Johnstown is an amazing and inspiring story. Uh, uh, day after the flood, the, the town was, you know, uh, nothing but debris. Uh, scattered buildings still standing, made their way across the wreckage, you know, up to the upper part of the downtown. Uh, started, you know, up on that uh, it happened there in different neighborhoods, but downtown, people, a couple hundred people started meeting right outside of the flooded district. And by early afternoon, they formed committees. You know, there were fundraising and police, and you know, there was even a committee to remove all the wreckage, which the entire town was wrecking. I mean, where are you going to start? And as it turns out, it took, well, the whole world's charity to put Johnson you know, back. In addition to the local committees, the nearby city of Pittsburgh, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and the American Red Cross also pitched in to the relief effort. The most memorable one probably is the American Red Cross. Claire Barton came here on June 5th. Uh, there were already Red Cross doctors here, so she took over material relief. It's estimated that something like 25,000 uh, local residents got some sort of you know, a support from Clara Barden. Nearly 75 years after the event, with help from a new historical novel, local residents came together to tell the story of the Johnstown flood. You know, with, with all the publicity and interest that uh, was generated by uh, David McCullough's new book, a group of local people formed to, you know, uh, started meeting and they decided they want wanted to make a place that told the story of the Johnstown flood. Uh, this museum is still, it's in the old Cambria Library, and that became vacant in 1971, and we opened in that uh, former library building in 1973. In the near future, the museum is hoping to add new exhibits for visitors to experience. But what we're planning to do incrementally now the building needs an upgrade, and we're going to start that this year, as well as doing some new and interactive digital exhibits to complement what was been, has been there for a while. Uh, one we'll have done by the end of this year is called uh, Voices of the Survivors. We have taped recordings and you know uh, transcribed interviews with survivors of the Johnstown flood. The museum is currently open six days a week. So if you have any interest in learning more about the flood and the history of Johnstown, check it out. For whether or not, I'm Salix Iverson. Hello everyone, it's student meteorologist Ryan DePhillips back with your extended forecast. And after that coastal storm moves its way off the coast Friday and Saturday, expect to see some drier conditions and warmer air on Sunday with a high of 57 degrees and mostly dry conditions. Expected as well through Monday and Tuesday with at or slightly above warmer air. But as we have some showers later Tuesday night, temperatures dip back below normal and again we have a slight chance of showers on Friday. But now we'll take it over to Joe Rook at the desk. And now for the weather whiz quiz question. In the United States, how many degrees Fahrenheit were temperatures above average this past March? Is it A, 0.5 degrees Fahrenheit, B, one and a half degrees Fahrenheit, C, 3.7 degrees Fahrenheit, or is it D, 4 degrees Fahrenheit? And the correct answer is D, 4 degrees Fahrenheit. 
And I have to say, Joe, we did have some very nice weather days in March. Absolutely. I did find myself spending some time outside enjoying the uh, warm temperatures. And that's all that we're going to have time for on this week's show. Um, I'm your host, Joe Rook. And I'm Ryan DePhillips. Have a great weekend.